Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity of presenting special guest George Siegel to the show today, director and producer. George began his career in front of the camera as a newscaster, sportscaster, and weathercaster. He worked in markets from Los Angeles to San Francisco, Seattle, Detroit, and San Antonio, Texas. In addition to work in front of the camera, George was also a feature reporter and producer. In 2001, he formed JEL Productions, a video production company that produces commercials, infomercials, television programs, and documentary films. The company also created their own original programming, which included a Texas travel program and a building and remodeling show. George is most proud of his latest venture, forming the documentary film company, Move the World Films Incorporated. George wrote, directed, and produced the award-winning documentary films, The Last House Standing, and Licensed to Parent. George, his wife Nancy, and three children live in Tampa, Florida, and it's with great pleasure that I welcome George to the show. Welcome to the show, George. Hey, Jason, thank you so much for having me on. We're practically neighbors. I, I know. Uh, that's, that's, that's just amazing. I, I, I got a chance to see your, your film, and I want to share with you, I know I told you this before we started, but it really it was impactful for me. It gave me, because of the line of work that I do, obviously, I'm already kind of biased in certain ways, because I, I think I told you this off the air that I do homeowner claims and business claims for disasters like hurricanes for insurance in Florida and a few other states. So I've, I've kind of had my own viewpoints of this situation for some time. And the fact that you've created this film to me speaks volumes to what we should be trying to do to get everyone who lives in the Sun Belt, in California, in all these various places where you have a risk of flood, earthquake, fire, hurricane, tornado, that we've got we've to gotta build houses and structures that can withstand these things. And one of the underlying themes that I got from your film is that we have the capacity to do it because we have the South Florida building code, but we're just sloppy about it. Profit is more motivating for us than sustainability and resiliency. And I wanted to ask you for the first question is, what is your viewpoints on how we can change that existing structure to make it a better paradigm for us to be better prepared for these disasters with our housing materials and the construction and creation of, of, of our residences and buildings to be protected against the risks that we know exist? Well, unfortunately, to do it probably the best way would be if our lawmakers just said, we're going to make the toughest codes possible. We're all going to adopt South Florida standards. And that's it. Game over. You have to do that. That will likely never happen. So where, what my film approaches it from the direction of, okay, we have to start at the bottom. It's like a wake-up call for homeowners. Everybody has to demand more, which in a market that's as hot as it is now, especially right here, if you demand more, they're probably going to go on to the next buyer and they're not even going to sell to you. But then maybe they're doing you a favor. And you, we, we have to get people saying, okay, what are the hazards where I'm going to buy? And does this house have the structure? Is it built in a way that will actually survive them? And I think many people would find out the answer is no, it does not. So I'm trying to approach it from the bottom up because even in disasters, as you saw, you know, in Mexico Beach in 2018, Hurricane Michael devastated that area. They changed the wind code from 130 miles an hour to 140 miles an hour. But the, the, no, the category five <laughs> hurricane is what hit them. So if another storm came through like Michael, it would do the same thing. So 
I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know what it takes. And I'm just, you know, I'm hoping that this film gets traction enough where people wake up, they start going to their builder or their home buyer, the pre- people they're buying a house from, and they'll say, no, your house isn't worth a million dollars. You have windows from the 1940s. You have a roof that'll blow off in a strong wind. You know, it's, but but people have to do it. You have to, you know, as I told you before, it's tough to get people to, first of all, to watch a film and then to get them to take action on it is the is even a tougher step. But all we have to do is wait for the next disaster. And then we see how heartbreaking it is. Gets people's attention for a little bit. Then they go back about their business. But we have to get it in the front of their mind. I agree 100% with you. And I, I think you and I live in Tampa. So every time we're in a hurricane season, half the year, it's like I sometimes I feel like we're, we're facing the barrel of a, of a shotgun. And even though Tampa has been spared, almost like since 1920 something, right? Mm-hmm. 23, 24, they say. And there's this, this, I don't know, since you're a fellow Tampa resident, if you, the fact that we're protected by the burial mounds or the Seminole Indians and all that, supposedly there's a protective bubble and Hurricane Charlie in 04. Yeah. Made a, it's, it's just folklore. But my, my point is this, living in a, in a vulnerable area like we are, every time there's a new storm out in the Gulf or the Atlantic, it, it creates this anxiety, I feel, for anyone who lives in this area that we we have to think about what can happen in the, in the blink of an eye, right? Cause mother nature could be not forgiving on any of us with just once it only takes one storm to go in the right area. You, you would think that, yeah. but you know how people are here. They'll <laughs> say a storm is coming and the day before everyone runs out panic to get water and batteries and whatever. But those are things that might help you be a little more comfortable in the storm. They're not going to save your house at that point. You know, it's like hurricane preparedness week is in May. I find that to be laughable because the time you should be preparing is December, January, exactly. when there's no danger of having a hurricane. You know, when we had Elsa earlier this year, that looked bad for us. It was following a path that would be very bad for this area. It's like the storm that hit last year at, at the end of October, early, late October, early November. If they follow a certain path, we had houses that were flooded in this area, in, in Tampa, from a tropical storm. Mm-hmm. So it gives you a taste, as we show in the film, the Hurricane Phoenix scenario that they did. It was a, a, a focus, a test of what would happen if a major hurricane hit Tampa in 2010. They said 500,000 homes would be destroyed, that 2 million people would need medical attention. And the population has exploded since then. So we're champ numbers. Are, yeah. <laughs> right. Those we numbers. can win every sports event and team every year, but we can't defend against a hurricane. I mean, no. that's a scary thought. It's a frightening thought. And, and it shows how we aren't ready. And the people I know that have grew up here and have lived here a long time, most of them don't have generators. They don't really worry about it. They're probably the kind of folks that will go out and have a party saying the hurricane's not going to hit us. And like they do in New Orleans all the time. And then they kind of laugh at the storm. Mm. But as we've seen, it's not laughable. It's deadly. And we have to take it very seriously. Well, and you know, that's something too, is like the fatigue of over preparation or not over preparation, over oversimplifying the hurricanes and their threat to us in Tampa, right? I want to ask you this with your movie, have you had any blowback from politicians, elected officials? I know you've interviewed FEMA officials and people in the industry for housing construction industry and victims of different events. And I was curious to see what was your response? What response, if any, have you received from elected representatives or officials or governmental entities as a result of the film that you've now put out there? You know, I haven't heard anything negative. I know FEMA loved the film. They're tough to get into interview because they're so maligned every time there's a disaster. I mean, when you're called in to to help people, it's a thankless job. And, you know, no matter what political affiliation you are, some way you'll find a reason to rip them. And some of it may be fair, some of it may be not. Our film doesn't deal with that. We went to FEMA and said, we want to proactively talk about how to prevent that kind of thing. So, you know, it's a lot cheaper to fix things before they break than to repair them afterwards. And so FEMA loved it. So we got positive feedback from them. Other politicians, I had a hard time trying to get them in the film. I mean, I tried to reach our state senators. I tried to reach a lot of politicians. I couldn't get anybody that would talk to us. And people here on like the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, they were great. They interviewed us, the people, the emergency folks here, because they have a genuine concern for for having this be a good thing and not a bad thing. You know, I don't want to criticize people. I want to encourage them to do better. And so we really made the film in a way that shouldn't, I guess the enemies, if people would hate us, I would think builders might not be too <laughs> fond of it. And I'm, I'm not that fond of, of a lot of them yeah. because if you proudly put your head up and say, I build to code, 
What is that? Well, and how about this? <laughs> in your movie, you start off talking about Hammurabi's code. And I studied that in law school. And I was laughing when I saw the, the mention of it, that if back then in ancient times, that if a house collapsed and caused death to the owner of the house, the builder would be put to death. Could you imagine if nowadays, I shouldn't say now, if, if in modern times, the builder was held responsible for the house being in improper construction if if they're well aware that they're driven by profit and they don't look at you know why building cheaper is worse than actually trying to create a system where we can withstand these events and not have such catastrophic losses of life injury and property well as a lawyer you know they would just fold their llc and open the business next week under a different name so they would they may may avoid death like in the hammurabi's code so the, the problem is how do you hold them accountable? And, and there's a lot of really good builders out there. This is, I'm, I don't want to make it like our film is against builders. I think builders that build safer houses should be rewarded and ranked above the builders that don't. And I'm all for that. When I hear builders that are saying, yeah, I only build concrete block houses. I only do, you know, roofs that uh, are bracketed a certain way to the, to the walls and, and they do all these different steps. I think they should get all the attention. There should be extra points for that on Zillow and realtor.com. So they're rewarded for doing better. And then the other ones will have to raise their game if we stop buying the crap that they're building. If we stop accepting mediocrity, they're going to have to change because nobody's going to buy their houses. What do you take about climate change itself and affecting everything at the same time, population growth in the Sun Belt, like Tampa, you brought up Tampa. We're one of the fastest growing areas in the Southeast, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so you've got these mass, I mean, anywhere in downtown you look and there in Tampa, there's mass construction going on. They're reorganizing the city, building all these constructed construction projects. And I want to ask you with population growth and, and global warming and climate change, I just think it's a recipe for a disaster in the future that we're, it's just a ticking time bomb. And I wanted to ask you, what's your opinion on that? Well, we're better off than South Florida because the water's rising faster down there. You know, they have flooding on days when it's not even raining. The water just <laughs> comes up through the ground. So it's pretty crazy. You know, climate change is one of those minefield issues because that is probably one of the most political topics there is. And, and so one side's going to say there is no climate change. The other side's going to say climate change. We have to do everything, throw away gas cars, uh, you know what? change everything. I'll say this. Is it really a political issue, though, when the planet no, is eating no, it up? I, just no. don't, I think anyone who thinks it is a political issue is just mistaken and has to really get caught up with times of what we're living in. And they're just not in the right chapter of their book. We're very, on different well pages. Said. Right. And I don't yeah. want to malign anyone, but I disagree with anyone who thinks it's a political issue because we're going to basically we're heating up the planet so that our children are going to suffer worse than we are right now. And I don't understand how anyone can make that a political issue. But unfortunately, it is. If you watch the news, you know, there's people that will say <laughs> climate change isn't the problem. And then other people say we need billions of dollars to, to counteract it. And, and my approach with the film is, OK, whether there's climate change or not, we're living in more vulnerable areas. The experts in our film clearly point out how storms are getting more intense, more severe. Damages are exploding in storm in, in you know, where these hazards are occurring. So we're doing a crummy job of protecting against that. And if we wait for solving climate change, one of the experts in our film, Jennifer Francis, says we can't stop it. We might be able to slow it down. You know, who knows how many years it'll take for that to be fought over and funded and changed. So what can we do right now? You can make sure your house is as safe as possible. You don't need a politician to tell you that. You don't need an elected official to say, hey, you got to do this. You got to do that. All you have to do is get an inspection and find out where your vulnerabilities are and decide whether it's worth keeping that house and fixing them or risking everything and not doing it. Let's, and then, you know, that's pretty simple. But I know that is true, but let's look at the economic situation with that. You're going to have a lot of people who have gone through COVID who don't have a lot of money, probably resources mm -hmm. around right now. So for them to be able to upgrade their house or rebuild, like, you know, I saw that in your film, you, you, you consulted some people that said what you need to do to put your house up the code. And we'll get into that in a minute. But when you look at the economic variables of that, I think that this is something that government needs to take a more active role in legislating. And I also think government needs to take an active role in updating there should be grants available to allow people to upgrade their houses to withstand storms in the disaster area of where they live, fire, earthquake, flood, hurricane, tornado, whatever it is. There should be some grants in place because I don't see an average. I, we were talking earlier about how hard it is for people to get paid on their insurance claims, right? How do you think these people are going to afford to upgrade their houses? So maybe you can't do the major things. So you approach things on the list of what you could do. You make sure you have insurance. You make sure that you have a, a good rated insurance company 
that you've documented everything in your house so you can prove it to your insurance company and you've taken pictures of it. So th that's your bottom line. You know, if you live in an area that floods, you better have flood insurance. There's a lot of older homes around where I live that uh, it's very expensive to have flood insurance because they're built at, at sea level. And I think the flood level in this neighborhood is nine or 10 feet. Uh, I'll say this to you. I, I specialize in flood claims, one of the areas I do. And I'll tell you this, any homeowner who has or suffers a loss, you're right. It, it's better to be prepared before the, the, the crisis happens, before the storm event or the loss event, because anyone who has a flood policy, it's likely going to take them two years to fight their federal government insurance program through federal lawsuits to get paid everything they're owed. And then you got people with the homeowner's insurance or pro private insurance, like we talked about off the air, is that these insurance companies will fight They'll delay, deny, defend, fight these people. But you're right. If they could have the house fixed up front and updated with the proper protocols, they may not have to deal with the insurance end of it. Even though an insurance is necessity, it's a necessity, but it's not going to be a convenience for anybody. People think with flood like or any insurance policy, and I tell them in my line of work as a lawyer talking to them, you can expect any insurance dispute to likely take 18 months in the state of Florida based on the fact that if you're winding up in court and if the insurance company doesn't want to pay you, it's going to be a drawn out fight. So how do people prepare for those real life circumstances? And I love the fact that your film is getting them to think before the event even happens. It's almost like your film is telling people, look, in five years, there might be a major storm. Why don't you take care of these steps now, right? Why don't we look at this intuitively and figure out how to prevent the next disaster? Yeah, I mean, you absolutely have to do that, especially when you paint the side of, of how insurance is going to go for people. Still, that's a great, you, you should have that as your last line of defense. Just because they may make it difficult doesn't mean you want to abandon that. Exactly. You know, with Hurricane Harvey in Houston, all the people that were flooded there did not live in a flood zone. And they could have bought flood insurance very inexpensively. So you talk about people that may not have a lot of money or may be struggling. If you were told for $300, you might be able to protect your investment. You could maybe budget things, work things around to do that. I'm not saying it's easy. I agree. But, but you have to look at it and say, okay, you know, Brock Long said it best in the film. If it rains where you live, your house can flood. I, and I, tell, I tell people the same thing because I deal with flood. I tell anyone who lives in the state of Florida, no matter where you live, it doesn't matter if you're on top of a hill, if you're in the middle of the state, or if you're right along the water, get flood insurance. Because guess what? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you live based on the flood zone. Because in Mississippi and other places, there were that 100 year old, you know, you know the 100 year flood map, the flood rate map, the firm map, they call it. And guess what? Every time those storms hit, there's always flooding that happens. The first event in 100 years destroys all these houses. And everyone always says, I didn't get flood insurance because my insurance agent told me I didn't need it because the flood rate map, you know, it hadn't been that catastrophic in 100 years. And it's yeah. always like, you got to think of these things, right? And most people in the public don't think of these things because it's not in front of them as something to think about. Your film, in my opinion, is so pivotal and so important to start the dialogue to get people thinking internally of what they should really be doing right now. Well, look at all the people in California and Malibu in that fire and probably in paradise. They had older cars. They had houses that had no mortgage. So they lowered their insurance. You know, if you think about that, that's insane because the cost of rebuilding is probably 10 times what it was when they originally put that house there. Mr. Corman, the elderly gentleman in Malibu, he had these antique cars and coins and all these things that he didn't. He took the insurance off his Mercedes because it wasn't working and it burned down. It melted down to nothing. So, you, you know, people think, well, I didn't get in an accident. I don't really need as much auto insurance and and then you go out and get in an accident. You can't look back at the end of the year and go, I didn't need that. You have to look back and go, thank God I didn't need that. Now I'll be ready for next year in case I do. You really have to change your, your attitude. And it's hard to get people to do that. Because when, when we had that uh, Elsa this year, the next storm we were warned about, because they really did go all out warning us how bad this could potentially be. Once you cry wolf and the next one, people are going to just be going, yeah, the last one missed us. Maybe this one will miss us. And, and that's a, a, the wrong approach to a disaster because it, it, it's, it's it a is. recipe for disaster. You're right. And I, I've even been lulled living in Tampa since 1993 on and off and in Florida since that time. I, I feel like, oh, these storms aren't that bad. It never hits us directly where I live. <laughs> and then this is the line of work that I do. Yet I'm lulled into a certain sense of, you know, reluctance in certain ways when I see what's going on in our world and, in, in, you know, in our states and, and what's going on in our economy. Looking at the film, one of the things that really caught me and impressed upon me was when you had a section that you talked to, to a representative from the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. And what I liked about that segment was they test, basically, they put houses through rigorous tests from what I saw, and they, and they try to see what it would take to survive a, a disaster. 
However, what I saw from the film, they only did up to a category three storm. And I wanted to ask you, what was your feelings when you interviewed them and you saw that they only do testing up to category three? Because, you know, with the way we are right now, a category three is something that happens more frequently than not. Well, as you could see, when they got to that level, the house was destroyed, you know, you to go higher, the house was already gone. You know, maybe they found that to be the destruction level where beyond that you have to build to sustain it. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I, I imagine it's difficult to crank it up to a category five. I, I, those tests are very expensive to put an, an item in there and, and see how, how it survives. But what they showed at a category three or what they showed with fire is frightening of how those houses burn down and blow down. So if everybody built to a category three, I mean, we rarely get fours and fives. And as Roy Wright said in the film, you know, if a, if a major tornado, if an EF5 tornado steamrolls right over your house, there might be no construction technique in the world that could save you. But that's the direct path of it, or that could be the bullseye of the hurricane. But as you extend out from the center, the winds aren't always as strong and, and you can prevent damage that is occurring now regularly, like with tornadoes. More Oklahoma was leveled four times by powerful tornadoes until they changed the building code. Now, the building code is not going to save your house in an EF5, but the house that's 100 yards to the center of that might save the entire house because the garage now has to be sturdier. The walls have to be built differently. So Obviously, you can't bunker everything a thousand percent, but you try to Im make improvements that increase your chance of surviving. That's all we can do at this point is figure out how to best, you know, adjust things. You know what? You know what I find? The profit motive behind all this that you build with the cheapest materials for the greatest profit, right? Overhead and profit is always something I see in my industry with contractors and, you know, with construction projects. And when you look at that Surfside community collapse that just happened here in the East Coast, I mean, it, it was gripping. It's it's horrifying. And you think had the, the necessary precautions been made. Now, that wasn't a hurricane that destroyed that collapsed building, but it was faulty materials, I'm sure. And they're going to probably find that there were there were probably some type of cheap maintenance failure in in terms of updating things. And I, I think that this is a this is like an infrastructure issue, in my opinion, even though it's not roads, bridges. I still think houses and where you live, if you're in a proximity of where a disaster is known to strike, you should have some type of ability to prepare in advance, kind of like have your action plan. And I think your, 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 your film, I feel, does a really good job at creating the circumstances to get people to really pay attention. That's what I got from your film, your call to action through the Thank whole you. film, the urgency of it. It <laughs> resonated with me. You know, that's tough to do in a, in a condo association or a homeowners association, because when you're talking about assessments building wide, you're always going to get people at different stages of their lives and maybe they want to spend the money, maybe they don't. You know, you really have to, as this is all investigated, we'll find out more information. But, you know, if one person wanted to fix it, it's not enough. I mean, we heard a story of a woman in, I believe it was next to Mexico Beach. She lived in a townhouse but it was a duplex. So there was people on the, on her left and she was in the duplex on the right. And the building was destroyed by the hurricane by Michael. They didn't want to fix their half. So she wasn't allowed to fix her half. You can't just have half a duplex and that's just two people. So now multiply that by 150 residents or 200 residents and half of them say, no, we don't want to have a $10 million assessment. It's very challenging. And we don't really know everything that, that went on there. So Obviously, it's easier if it's just your house and you're not having to deal with other people. But when you get into associations or neighborhoods where you have to rely on the whole community doing it, it can be even more challenging. You know, that, that, you raise a very excellent point, by the way. The responsibility, collective responsibility. I feel like we all have to be collectively responsible to help the community understand what's needed here. If you're going to choose to live in Florida, you should work together to get this type of stuff to work. I mean, if it means that community has to be involved politically to get candidates in there, to get elected that are going to enact changes, like create platforms, right? If, if your film could create that kind of an element to advise people, look, your house might be worth that as your greatest investment that you're proud of, but it doesn't take much like a, a deck of cards with a house built on a deck of cards, like huff and puff and blow the house down. Well, any storm can go through and do any of that 
in the blink of an eye. And so what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Community, right? Well, if, the, if the last up. two, if the last two potential storms for us were not a wake up call, I don't know what is. Because like I say, if you drew out a path and said, this is the worst case scenario for you, Tampa, and those two could have met that criteria with a little turn here or there, we could have suffered major damage here. And I still don't hear that kind of outcry for, for major change. As Hank Ovink talked about with us in the film, he said that it takes a major disaster. And then that disaster is like an MRI or an X-ray of your community. And it shows where the vulner vulnerabilities were so you can build back better. But the idea is, OK, let's avoid that. You know, I don't want to get an MRI once I have stage four cancer. I would rather you tell me way before how I could prevent that from happening and then live a longer life. And I, th I think that we can do that with our homes. We know how there's there's certain things you can do that will make it safer and increase your chances of surviving. Uh, you really have to shake them to wake them, wake them up. You know this as well as I do. It's difficult to get people to change their thinking. You just hope that it happens, but it's hard to do. You know, that's a good point. And, and most people are only going to act as a react, right? They're only going to react to something. They're not necessarily going to look at ahead of time what they should try to do. And so the question becomes at that point, whose responsibility is it? Is it on the individual person that owns the property? Is it our electric? I think it's everybody's. That's what I said earlier, but what is your opinion on that? What, when you did your project and you did your film, what was your takeaway from it in terms of how to change this? It's up to us because it's only going to change in a community, unfortunately, after they're destroyed. And, and even then, as they saw in Malibu, when they're trying to build back after the fire, the building code was so tough that the only way you could quickly rebuild your house is if you followed the same footprint that was on the lot previously, you couldn't do something dramatically different. So they weren't even accommodating to let's get this back together and 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 work together to make it happen. You're always getting pushback, you know. So there there's no easy answer. We, you know, we asked the builder that we talked to in uh, Moore, Oklahoma, whose responsibility it was to build safer houses, and he said he thought it was the buyer's responsibility to ask for it because the builder may put those things in, but the buyer may not want them. Exactly. So in in Oklahoma, for example, he may put in an expensive storm cellar. And it may limit the people that want to buy it. But if you ask me, oh. I don't know how anybody could have a house there and not have a storm cellar. I was yeah. shocked to find out they're under four grand for one that could save your life. If you factor that into a 30 year mortgage, you might not even notice the payment, mm. you know, and, and they'll give you low interest loans on those things. But a large percentage of people in Oklahoma do not have a storm cellar. That's crazy to me. That's ridiculous. I want to ask you, what prompted you to, to do this project? Like what, what caused you to create The Last House Standing? You know, it was a cumulative thing. When I was in the news business, in TV news, we would always go out and cover stories of people that were badly damaged in, in disasters. I went up to Moore, Oklahoma in 1998 and interviewed a woman who the only thing left on her slab was a bathtub and the mattress that she had held over her to keep from getting sucked out of the house. Everything else was wiped clean. And when you interview these people and meet them, that look on their face, that shell-shocked, I've just lost everything look, it just is so powerful and so it's painful to experience. And when I got out of the news business, I was involved with a guy who was building concrete houses and had a passion for building houses out of concrete. And it made sense to me. It's like, wow, there's a, there's a substance that you can build that actually increases your chances of not having your home destroyed. And if you are flooded... It's not going to wick up your walls and destroy everything because it's concrete. People don't want to do that because it costs a little more money sometimes to build it. Now with the, the price of wood rising like it did recently, maybe that's equaled out. But I just I said, I want to make a film that, that could make a difference and do something. I've built a lot of houses. I've disliked a lot of builders in the process with, with how personalism, you talk about counting nickels and seeing where they save and where they don't. And so I said, you know, I think I have some, some value here that I can bring to people to wake them up, to make them aware of a situation, and it's something they can actually do something about. And, you know, it's, it's a long process, but it's one that I'm very passionate about. And, you know, I'm going to continue to, to chase after. I, I think it's fascinating because based on your experience, uh, I will say you present a very captivating point of view with this. And from my vantage point, because of my background with what I do, I'm pretty optimistic as a person, but I think we need to have governmental action in order to motivate 
individual or the business community. You know, there's got to be something that we got to figure out. Have you thought of those steps beyond your film that you would suggest or recommend based on your actual involvement in this project of, of ways that we can, as a takeaway, for, for example, what would you say to our audience would be your greatest takeaway from the movie and how to change the current status of things? Well, I think that dealing with elected officials and politicians is like going and beating your head against a wall. <laughs> and it, it is a, a time consuming. I mean, when I called to try to interview some of these guys, I understand they're busy. This certainly seemed like a subject that was relevant in Florida. I didn't even get callbacks or blow offs from a lot of people. <laughs> I tried to get funding from the insurance industry. Nothing, not Crickets. a nickel. Crickets. Crickets. <laughs> and you would, you, would, you would think that they could actually benefit from the success of a film like this, because if people stopped having to make claims, maybe that would be a good thing for them. But it was crickets. So when I've tried to go at times to get funding from the concrete industry, who has a fortune, those guys have a lot of money. I've never raised a nickel from the concrete industry for anything. So that makes me cynical and it makes me frustrated from the point of view that the only people that I think I can really speak to are the homeowners because they're like me. We we own houses or we're renting somewhere. We have our stuff and we care about it. So if nobody's going to care about us, we need to show them that we care about us. And we're going to stick our feet in the ground and say, we're not going to put up with this crap. If you're going to build garbage, we're not going to buy it. If you're not going to make it safer, we're not going to reward you by going around and bragging about your work. You know, it's like you try to just chip away at it. But I think it takes a, this is like, a, it takes a village. It takes all the people in the community to say, we're tired of settling for less. You want to put up a wood house in Tampa? Go ahead. Just hope it doesn't hit my house when it's blowing apart and shattering into a million pieces. How difficult was it for you to fund this project based on what you just said that you tried to go to different industries to help with funding? Like, where, how did you finally get the funding you needed to do the, the, the film? It was very challenging, very difficult. I happened to have found a group of people that we had set up a nonprofit, Move the World Films initially was a nonprofit. And so they were able to contribute to the film because they had the same passion for the project as I did. And they were, I found some people that believed in, in me and in the project. And you'll see their names in the credits when you watch the film. That's how this film got made. I could not have done it by myself. Unfortunately, any filmmaker will tell you, you you spend money to make a film, but you never raise enough money to promote a film. Everybody goes, wow, you know, you should have 10 or 15, 20% of your budget should be for promotion. Nobody has that money left mm. unless you're a big studio, you know, unless you're um, somebody famous who people throw money at to make documentary films. The little filmmakers, we all have to do it ourselves. It's, and I'm not crying a river here. I'm just saying no. the reality of it is it's, it's, it's work. It's a struggle. And so, you know, the, the obvious people, it's like whenever you have a great idea, you think this is obvious. People are going to jump all over this. To me, in, in, the, in the history of my career, the most obvious things, I've never gotten anybody to budge on. And then stuff that just I didn't think was that good. People, oh, wow, that's, that's really good. <laughs> so none of it makes sense. And it's enough to make you pull your hair out. So, you know, I felt like we were underfunded. But thank goodness those folks helped us to make this film because now it's out. And now you just try to keep fighting to get people to see it and to do something with it. You know, public television stations are slowly airing it. It was on a couple of cool. times here on WEDU in, uh, in Tampa. It, universities, I've gotten it into a, um, an organization that distributes it to universities um, and makes it available to them. So you just keep pushing, but uh, gosh, it would be nice to have had a famous last name and to have raised a million dollars <laughs> to do it, but it, well, it didn't work out that way. And why not? Why hasn't Hollywood taken a stronger approach in supporting these kind of projects? You know, there was a film that I saw, Rebuilding Paradise. Ron Howard made a documentary about Paradise, California. And, you know, I'm very competitive and I, you know, go, I don't know if I want to watch that, but I love Ron Howard. So I watched the film and I could see what you can do when you have a lot more money to make a film. They followed a bunch of people around for a year and showed how messed up their lives were in the process for rebuilding after that major catastrophe. When you're a smaller company, you can't afford to follow that many people around because some of them aren't going to make it. Some of them aren't going to make it into the film. They could have, you know, deaths, divorce. A lot of things can happen that you have to say as a producer, okay, I can't use that. I can't use that. So they can make more bold directional choices in making a film. And when you're a smaller company, you need to get it right. If you go to interview somebody, hopefully they're there. It took me over a year and a half, I think, to interview Hank, Hank Ovink with scheduling and everything. 
And then finally he was going to be in St. Pete. And they said, well, you, you can interview him in St. Pete. If you want, we'll try to work you in at four or five in the afternoon. And I said, this is a busy guy. There's no way that'll happen. I said, let me have eight in the morning. And they go, we don't know if Hank will get up for that. And I said, just please ask him. And this, this man did it. He met us at eight o'clock in the morning. Wow. And then his day went south because he's so in demand. <laughs> but but you, can you, you imagine beat, you, you beat the demand that got ahead and early bird oh, gets the worm. <laughs> my goodness. No, it worked out perfectly. And then, um, you know, I flew my crew in for this. It would have cost us a lot of money if we failed on that. And thank goodness we didn't. Same thing with going to interview the FEMA director. You know, we fly to Washington, D.C. If you're a big company and, you know, for some reason they cancel, you just go back. When you're a little company doing that, you don't mm. have that choice. You have to have somebody play the FEMA director on the street that you meet <laughs> and say, Hey, Phil, you be the FEMA director. You, know, so you, you have to hope it works out. So it's, there are challenges. And you know, it, when I talk to other filmmakers, everybody has the same challenge. So it's not a unique problem just for, for poor little me. Just, you know, the challenge is overcoming them. What was the greatest challenge for you in terms of making sure you maintain your message throughout the whole film? Is keeping my opinion out of it. And I like to let the story tell itself. You know, I don't need to go in there and, and voice my opinions on climate change and what people need to do. I don't need to bash builders and say they need to build safer houses. I let experts tell the story. When you're looking at a house that's destroyed, we don't have to discuss how well it was built. I think it's obvious. It's um, a failed structure at that point. Yeah. When you're talking right? about when you're talking about a category five hurricane late in the year pummeling an area. That, that kind of shows you that storms are staying strong later in the year. When you look at what happened in Hurricane Sandy years ago, that storm traveled all the way up the East Coast late in the season. I mean, the, these, there's droughts in California that are record dry years that they're having out there. It's not just a little anomaly. There's major pattern changes that we're dealing with. So it's not letting my opinions enter, but letting the story tell it because I didn't want to piss off half the people that were watching by thinking it's a Netflix documentary where you know who made it. You know, <laughs> you know what party made it, what their agenda was, because it's all over the film. And I really think this doesn't have that. It's just about homeowners and everybody should be able to relate to it. I know you had to get this project funded. Do you see a sequel coming to this project in the future, which would actually be more about what the action steps would be? Would there be anything like that you've thought about? Yeah, we're, I'm working like, on it. I, I have a you're going to have a new project coming up and, and it's a sequel to this. I pick up stuff when I do interviews. So intuitively, I'll tell you, it's going to be successful more than this project even will be. So I hope that's the psychic part of you. That, that is a psychic that, part of me talking to you. I'm just throwing see that. hats in the middle of a conversation. But yes, I, I, I felt a sequel. I felt a call to action, the next step. And I felt it was a completion of your story. You know, 20 years ago, I had a psychic tell me in a reading that I was going to have a redheaded child and I ended up having one. So I, I, I hope you're right because I, yes, I, I feel that way. I do feel that way. I have a whole pitch for it, a whole plan of how it would go and what we would focus on in different areas of the country. But, you know, it's starting at ground zero. That's starting at ground zero to raise money for a project like that. That's a lot more expensive than the film we just made. So it's a process, you know, and what's interesting when you look back over it, it's like, I'm, I, I'm always critical of anything I do. I'm, I'm always going, gosh, I could have done this better. I could have done, I'm probably a lousy guy to have at the morale meetings because I'm never <laughs> happy. And I look at this film and I go, wow, I really, with a talented team of people that I could not have done it with, a very small group of people, I think we made something really good. And so I then when you, go to, when you go to start over with the next project, it's, you know, it's kind of overwhelming because you go, okay, now I got to raise more money and I've got to do something even bigger and better. But hey, it's, uh, you know, it's a challenge. I'm all in. We'll see how it goes. I also think you're going to get better funding from someone with a higher name that's going to help you. Someone through contacts of somebody's going to have a passionate aspect to this and you're going to get some funding from some private individuals who have pulled. I need a psychic reading with a name and number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that good, but I can give you enough guidance sometimes. Oh, I, didn't mean to bring it up here. I, I kind of digress sometimes. I just pick up stuff and I feel like saying, hey, if it's coming through for a reason, let's just share it. But I like that. <laughs> thanks. I want to ask you this. When you're looking at everything you've done to date, where do you see your career five years from now? Gosh, I hope I'm living on uh, Lake Cuomo in Italy. And uh, no, I don't know. I, 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 I love doing what I'm doing. So I hope it's, it's somehow involved with this project. I have another idea for a film I really want to make. And it's just a fun process 
to do it. You know, it's like, and you hope as a filmmaker that you make something really good. So when you do put the word out that you're doing something else, people want to get involved with you, but you know, that's challenging. And I, my whole career has been a challenge. Anything I've ever gotten, nobody's generally called me for a job. I've had to call them a hundred times and it's persistence. And I'll put the same persistence into anything I do, hoping to be successful at it. Well, and I'll say that it, it's persistence that created the film. It's yeah. persistence that got you to where you are right now. And it's going to be persistence that does the other stuff I feel that like you're going to be doing in the future. Yeah, so, so looking at from your perspective as a film creator, a director, producer, what would you tell someone in our audience who's aspiring to be in production, but they haven't done anything yet and they really are interested in what we're talking about and they're passionate about these types of topics. And, and I would call it some, I would call it outright activism, which is very important by the way. And, I, and a paradigm changer, you're a thought, you're a thought maker, you're a thought changer, a, a visionary, in my opinion, creating the film you created. What advice would you give to some future person in your field that hasn't gotten to where you are yet, but has the vision, but doesn't know what to do next? Well, it's, first of all, I would tell them it's very hard to do something if you don't have a passion behind it, because in the film industry or like the TV industry that I was in, it's a lot of rejection and it's very personal. So when I was in TV, when you'd send out a tape, people are looking at your face and rejecting you on a regular <laughs> basis. It doesn't get more personal than that. It's not like uh, indeed.com where your resume gets passed over by somebody. You know, it's very personal in, in broadcasting with films. You know, it used to be you didn't have access to equipment, but now most people have some type of iPhone. You can go out and shoot on anything and create your vision. I would say go out and start trying to tell your story and have a have a plan for an outline for where you want it to go. A lot of people have an agenda for where they want it to go and you, that you risk alienating people. But I still like those, too. If you're somebody who believes in something extreme and that's what you want to make your film on, you can find your audience for that. Not everything is a mainstream. You know, I happen to think The Last House Standing affects anybody who lives in a house. But if your concern is the flight of the, the dodo bird and you're worried about it, do something with it and find, you know, with social media, you find people that have a common interest with what you do and have a, a like interest in seeing that happen and just start doing something with it. A lot of people talk about it you should actually do it. And there's ways to do it for very little money just to get it started so you have something to show people because we all have a device in our hands. Now, when we went to actually make the film, we have a 4K camera. You know, you need a lot of things depending on the level you want to try to hit. But I've seen videos on YouTube where people have made movies with iPhones. Funny, when I do the production aspect of my job, we're now competing against people. If, if I turn in a bid, I turned in a bid one time. This is a little side story. It was Guide, Guide Dogs of Texas wanted a marketing video. And I put together this lengthy proposal and it was going to cost like $10,000 to make it. And the guy calls me back and he goes, hey, George, I loved your idea, but my cousin is making it for $1,000. If you can match that, I will give the job to you because I really think you have great experience. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Wow. If I told you it was $10,000, that's what it's going to cost. I didn't throw in 9,000 of fluff mm -hmm. and just you know try to screw you with this. And I said, would you please show me the video that you get for $1,000? I'd love to see it when, when it's done. Never heard from the guy again. Because <laughs> I know what he got. He, he got of course. Crap. I, I so, mean, you, know, you pay for what you're paying for. You're paying for the quality, the experience, and the skills, and the know-how. You, you can't shortchange on that. For, for a creative project, you're, you're getting what you pay for. Yeah. So now everybody with an iPhone is a filmmaker. Everybody in LA, everybody that's a, a waiter is an actor. You know, it's like everybody wants to be something else. It's challenging. And you know, what's even more frustrating is when you try to market your stuff and you don't get traction on social media and then some kid lip syncs a song, you know, and he's on Good Morning America the next day because a million people watched it. You know, that just yeah. makes you want to rip your hair out. But the advent of influencers and social yeah. media and the world, how it's changed, right? It has. And good for them. I guess if you find a way to work it so you're successful, part of me is jealous, <laughs> but, part, but part of me admires that because you found a way to do it. Look at the Kardashians. I mean, <laughs> you know, my daughter watches that crap all the time and I, I can't watch five seconds of it. I, I've never watched it. <laughs> but at, they're, they're, they are billionaires. I know they are. Because of merchandise, that. merchandise, merchandise. Yeah. So you can hate them, but you also have to give them, you have to tip your cap and go, wow, you found something. 
Who's been your greatest influence in your field and why? I don't know that there's necessarily one person. You know, there's a lot of different films that I've liked over the years that I've, I've admired in terms of documentaries. I don't know if there's one person that I looked at and, and said that. You know, my experience was more from TV news telling my own stories or doing stories. And then I try to translate that into making a documentary film. There's no one person that I said, I want to kind of emulate that style. And, and, but in terms of feature films, I mean, there's, there's certain films that I've liked more than others and kept watching, you know, again, you know, there's always something that you go, if it's on and I'm flipping the channel, I'm not changing the channel. Um, with documentaries, you know, it's just, there's, there was nobody in particular that I said, I want to I'd be like that person. What was the biggest learning experience you had making this documentary? One is when you're budgeting, have more money for marketing after you make it. Um, the other is to understand how long a process it is to reach important people and get them to be in your film. You know, when we sat down at the FEMA director's office, the PR person came in just to say hi. And they looked at me and said, how the hell did you get in here? Because they had no idea how the process was to get in to see them. It was a lengthy process. And um, I just happened to catch the right guy in the office who goes, wow, this is a proactive film. They're not here to bash us. They're here to, to be a, a, an asset to what we're doing. So it's tough. Like I told you with Hank, it took over a year and a half to get him. The people that were the easiest to get were the people that were the most passionate about the industry. Like we interviewed a gentleman, Eris Papadopoulos in the film, who actually has made his own film, sort of similar to us, but he's been so accommodating, always answering my calls, always giving me advice, always telling me, you know, talk to this person, talk to that person. And it's the same with the, the flood vent guy. Tom Little was very generous with his time. Joel May, these guys, they care so much that if you're struggling, they'll say, well, call this person. Why don't you talk to that person? And, and that makes it a lot easier when you can get that kind of guidance. I need to ask you, how would our audience find you? And how would they find out about the movie? And so where would you direct our audience to go? Well, I hope you put a big fat graphic up in the very beginning of the interview, because I told you I was going to mention it and I never did because I, I, I'm going to put it in the show notes. And when I promote your show, it'll have all that information as well. Awesome. But if they go to the lasthousestanding.org, everything mm -hmm. triggers through our website, the lasthousestanding.org. You can rent the film on there. It's only $3.99 to rent it. Don't ask me why we came up with that number. I mean, everybody wants to charge more, but... And there's, there's connections to resources like to FEMA and different associations that give you advice on how to make your house safer and things that you can do. We give tips of things you should ask your builder when you're building a house, you know, or ask your realtor things that you should demand as a home buyer, blogs on there with information. And I really am trying to turn that into a resource that helps the next step of what we're showing people in the film. It's like, okay, you see this, you like it. Now here's action items you can take to actually do something about it. So they'd have to go to the lasthousestanding.org. And if that's a hindrance for you, you know, also on the website, we post when we're on public television stations, but that's one of those things that that's like changing the building code. It's hard to know uh -huh. when they're going to run it. You know, it's hard to get them to promote it. So the best way is to just go rent the film right on the website. And I was able to do that this afternoon, actually. It was very seamless. I just put in my information. I rented it. I watched it and I was impressed. Thank you. And, and you can probably watch it. I think it lets you watch it for up to 30 days. So you can watch like it. it. And if you're, if you don't have time, cause people get busy, you know, it, we, we have a, a system where we do screenings for groups through a platform online. And when they give a specific time, people get busy and they can't see it. So we try to extend that because, you know, something can happen and you just want to see it anyway. So it, it's a longer period than just you have right now to watch. Exactly. Exactly. I want to thank you for coming on. I want to ask you this. If you were a spirit animal, which spirit animal would you be and why? Oh, gosh. This is probably <laughs> the first question I've been asked. I have no idea where to go with that. I can know? go first if you want. Please. I always say owl. Owl okay. for me, because I have two parrots and I love birds, but uh, wisdom. As a lawyer, as a psychic, as a podcaster, I'm always about, like, I'm sure you are as well, the, the quest of wisdom and truth and understanding. And I, as a psychic, I look at things beyond the immediacy of right now to look at the big, big picture. And I feel like owls do all those things. That's a good one. My, my favorite animal is the giraffe. I, I collect those. If you were to walk into my house, I have a, a, a eight foot tall wooden giraffe and I have other giraffes all over the house. I've been on a safari where I've watched them because they're such a majestic animal. And I just, I love the beauty of them and just that the grace of how they move about. 
So I would have to go with the giraffe unless you're going to tell me it's not on the spirit animal. Uh, I mean, Hey, every animal has a spirit. No, oh, okay. absolutely. I'll cool. say this about, I'll say this about giraffes. I got to go to Bush gardens here in Tampa where they do a night feeding program with the college. Yeah. Of and I got to experience giraffes up close and it was amazing. What a, what a, amazing animal. I mean, majestic. Isn't that amazing? when they eat the lettuce out of your hand, yes. incredible. I mean, yes. it's like, wow. That, and I spent all this money to go to South Africa <laughs> on a safari. I could have just I went to Bush gardens. <laughs> what a save to fortune. It's okay. It's the experience that you got to do. I just want to thank George for coming on the show today and having an amazing conversation about such an important, vital topic. Global warming, in my opinion, at least, is a very vital thing. And I know the way the film was made, it's, it's a part of it. But the biggest part that I take away from this is we need to be more proactive now, and we can't just be reactive. We got to be proactive individually as a society, as legislators, and as in general. We just need to be proactive about this. There's really no other way to handle this. I've seen firsthand, and I can tell you this, and I don't really say as much on my show, but I've seen firsthand what destruction occurs when you deal with disasters like fires and floods and hurricanes. Most of my stuff's been hurricanes, but tornadoes, all those things destroy people's lives. If you could imagine this, when you're, when you're comfortable at night, walk around your house and think to yourself, how would you feel if everything you have, everything you own, everything you know is completely destroyed, completely cleared to just a slab? In Mississippi, when I used to work up there in Katrina work, I remember people telling me how hard it was for them to go back to where their houses were and they had what they, they called them stairways to heaven. I like the song stairway to heaven, but when I went and saw firsthand these staircases, these steps going up to nothing, and it was just blocks and blocks of destruction. When you can go in an area and it looks like ground zero of a massive catastrophic nuclear attack, that's what a lot of us who've seen these disasters can tell you it's like. It's disorienting, it's frustrating, and it can kill you. The stress and the anxiety, I've had clients die of heart attacks, suicide, divorce. So there's a human toll to all this. The practical side of it, think about the building materials your house is made of. If you're buying new construction, ask your builder, is my house going to be up to code of South Florida, the South Florida building code? Is it 175 miles up to 200 miles an hour? Or am I in an area where my Building officials have determined that 120 miles an hour reflects the standards of the local community. Because I can tell you right now, if you're living in a structure where the standards are below the thresholds to withstand a storm or any type of event, you're in a house of cards. Think of what that's like, because there's true ramifications. And yes, insurance is a big part of the equation, but being able to think about things in advance and plan properly is, is more important. And in my opinion, that really does take a conversation, a dialogue. And I'm so happy we had the start of that today. Check out the film. Check out the last housestanding.org. Go to the website, rent it. It's $4. You can go to Starbucks and get a macchiato for less than that. You know, this will be an investment in your own potential safeguarding of your of your livelihood of of your uh, everything so keep these things in mind i am very excited about this film i feel very much it's important to be out there and and we really need to have more films like this and look george represents somebody who privately financed it he's he didn't have you know a big studio behind him and i think that when you have restricted resources and you're still able to put out your message that says a lot about the project a lot about the passion behind it so check it out Move the World Films, George Siegel, please check out this film. And I'm so excited to promote it to each of you. Stay positive because when you're positive, anything's possible. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at info at the letter D, socialpsychicradio.com. I'll have all of George's contact information in the show notes. So be on the lookout for this information. And I deeply appreciate your support of our show. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook, and don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.